Good morning, church. It's great to see everyone this morning. We have a lot of friends and family who are here today, and we're going to sing everybody in this morning. Again, welcome, and let's, let's just sing. And I'm not sure if this is the right PowerPoint, by the way. There it is. There we go. All right, we are on the right one. Let us sing. Every praise is to our God, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah to our God. Every praise is to one. This is the wrong PowerPoint. I'm singing John's PowerPoint from last week, I believe, and it's lovely selections, but it's really throwing me for a loop. So let's stand and greet one another while we get the right PowerPoint up and enjoy the lovely poinsettias up front. We can be flexible. We can break a camera on the way. Hey, can you can you throw down a, a memory stick? Is there a memory stick up there? Black coat that's up there on the fuse. So if you can find the keys in one of those two pockets, and drop it down to us. I can load it onto. Helen, she's right back there, sitting by Mr. Jerry Canfield in the very, very back. She's sitting right there. See Mr. Jerry Canfield? She's sitting right next to her.
I hate to break the bad news, but your electronic Bibles will not work today either. So if you're an electronic Bible user, you may have to find a book around you because there is no internet, and so that's one of our issues. We'll get this fixed in just a few moments. That's why I said I need to make sure I Microphone check. Welcome to part five of the Adversity Gospel. You see, we're giving you a live experiment in adversity. Okay, so the PowerPoint is not working because the internet's down. And I don't even want to explain all that. We got great people up there working on fixing this. So... How about we show them some encouragement? All right. And I want to tell you a secret. For centuries, the church used to worship without PowerPoint. I know, I know, I know. You're reading along in your Bible, and it looks like, you know, Paul the Apostles got charts and 
PowerPoint and slides. And, no, it's not how it worked. But um, we might have something up here in a bit, but we are going to worship, yes. We're going to worship, and it is so good to see all of you. We have guests here. Uh, I would tell you to go to westark.org slash hello, but unless you have your own internet connection, forget it. But we got these old school cards. We are equipped. We got these old school cards for you to f- fill out. But just let us know that you're here today. What a wonderful Sunday this is to have everyone here. Now, we're not going to just sit around and wait. I think Brent is ready to go. By the way, we have some new technology we're going to work out. There are these things in front of you called books. They don't crash. You don't have to restart them. They don't need batteries. And we're going to use those as well. We're going to let them do what they're doing up there. And then suddenly we'll all be surprised. But this is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. So why don't you pray with me and then Brent's going to lead us in this first song. Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of having such simple little problems here in worship like this. That a faulty internet connection or loss of uh, heat and air, that, that uh, any of that cannot keep us from you and your love and your grace. That there is nothing that separates us from you. And wherever we're at, when we assemble together, we have the opportunity to encourage one another, to be encouraged, to sing praises. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Lord, be with us now as we experience this worship together as we celebrate what you have done for us as we consider what it means to experience real adversity as we consider what it means to look to Jesus as the one who sets the standard and the one who finishes the race and I pray that we will have that same sense of endurance now father You are worthy of our praise, and you are worthy of our encouragement, and we ask this in the name, we we celebrate this, we lift this up in the name of Jesus, and we all say together, amen. Amen. Well, let's sing amen. How about that? Sing. Amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God, amen, amen, sing. Amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God, amen, amen. When the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen. When the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen. Sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen. Let the people sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen. Let the people sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, rejoice, amen. So glad to see everyone this morning. We're going to introduce a song this morning, but before we introduce it, we're going to talk about the words a little bit. We, we sing songs, and in our tradition, four-part harmony is so important. And I think sometimes we miss out on sometimes the real meaning of the words in some of our songs. I love the fact that our songs encourage us. They prick our hearts. They stir our emotions. But this song really is a song about reflection. And I want to stand, please, and, and talk about, and we're going to say, I'm going to say the question, and I want you to answer with the reply at the end, where it says, the church says. And I want you to really think about all these questions that are being asked here as we sing this song. Who else commands all the host of heaven? Who else can make every king 
bow down. Who else can whisper? And darkness trembles. And the church says, Holy God, Holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? What other glory consumes like fire? What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? The church says, Who else could rescue me from my failings? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? The church says, Only my holy God. Only my holy God. Let's all say together, Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Let us see. Who else commands all the host of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else could whisper the darkness tremble? Only a
We are a moment, you are forever, Lord of the ages, God of your time. We are a labor, you are eternal, love everlasting, reigning on high. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Highest praises, honor, and glory be unto your name. Be unto your name. We are the broken, you are the healer. Jesus, redeemer, mighty to save. Father, we give you all honor and glory and praise this morning because you indeed are a holy God. And Father, we're so humbled to call you Father. And we're so grateful for all that you do for us and the many blessings you bestow on us daily. But Father, we're most grateful that you gave your one and only Son for the world And that if we accept your son and accept his will in our lives and accept him in baptism, Father, and we live a life of holiness that you've provided for us in your word, Father, that we can have eternity with you, Father. We just thank you for that opportunity. And Father, words aren't enough, are not enough to thank you. But Father, our hearts. Listen to our hearts this morning as we sing. Father, we ask that you just guide us. Father, where you lead, we will always follow. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guide my feet, Lord, while I run this race. Guide my feet, Lord, while Thank you. 
Time for our kids to come and give for Coins for Christ. Great time we get to enjoy every Sunday. Just be careful of the poinsettias here. You know, we've got a little, little obstacle here, but that'll be all right. Just come and give as we sing. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole children. Let's stand as we sing our song before the lesson this morning. Chris will be bringing us another portion of his word. Don't we all look forward to that habitation built by our living God? Cannot wait. There is a habitation built by the living God for us.
be seated. We were only able to recover the uh, the singing the song slides, so um, we're gonna have to go old school on this. But um, I want to. You get your if you'll find in your Bible Hebrews twelve. Uh, I've got some uh, pretty decent notes here, and uh, don't worry, it's not going to make the sermon any longer or anything like that. Uh, the um, let's talk a little bit about adversity because this is the kind of situation that all of this talk about the adversity gospel is not about. Because see, this is the sort of thing that, that becomes disruptive and we don't expect this. And then it's very quickly we can say, see, Satan's doing that. He doesn't want us to worship today. Okay, if this is all it takes for Satan to keep us from worshiping, yeah, we're in trouble. And, and Satan's not a gremlin either. He's not working in technology to just mess things up and make things inconvenient for you and I. That, that's not how it works. Now what Satan does want to do in adversity is, Satan wants to make my heart angry. He wants to make my heart bitter and resentful over the fact that things that I expect to work a certain way aren't working a certain way. Or people that I want to do certain things aren't doing what I think they should do. That's the adversity that we're talking about. And that's where Satan gets at me and gets at you. And then causes us, or leads us, tempts us really. He can't cause us to do anything. But he tempts us to make bad decisions and to feel justified in those bad decisions. Now, if we take a look at chapter 12, we'll recap what we talked about last week. Last week, we did part one of this called Run with Endurance. And, and here are the two things that we said. We said, number one, we are meant to run with endurance, even through the adversity. And we keep our eyes on Jesus. We focus in and we fix our eyes on Him. Why? Because He's the originator. He's the one that went before us. He's the one that set the standard and broke the record at the same time. He's the author, the perfecter, the originator, and the completer. So we fix our eyes on Him. We watch what He does. And we study and we imitate Jesus. We want to be like Him. We copy His moves. We try to do what He does. And if, as long as we do that, we will make it through whatever adversity we're up against. The other part of that lesson last week was grow up. We've got to grow up and be mature. And not just mature by a human definition of mature, but spiritually mature. Jesus is the perfecter, or He sets the standard, because He shows us what spiritual maturity as a fully grown adult human serving God is meant to look like. He's revealing to us what God has intended for us as humanity before sin came in, corrupted, stained, and disrupted the whole thing. So we grow up, we go into training, we yield to the training that God gives us. So sometimes adversity is the opportunity for us to exercise that spiritual maturity. And then that spiritual maturity yields a fruit, he says, of a peaceful harvest or a harmonious harvest of righteous living. Now, how do we get there? Well, that's our text this morning, and I'm going to start in verse 11, and I encourage you, if you have a Bible, if you have access to your online Bible, great. I hope you can make notes in it, because I'm going to give you the notes that you would normally see on the screen. I do that, by the way, so that you have something to take with you every week, because this sermon doesn't just end right here. It's best if you take it and live with it for a while and put it into practice and see how it goes. Yeah. So, Let's start in verse 11, because he's talking about the kind of discipline that comes through adversity. And, and, and the metaphor here is, 
God is our Father disciplining us as His children, not disciplining us to punish us, but to make us grow up, to encourage us, to train us. So that we can be spiritual athletes and we're good at living this righteous living. Verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, When he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. You've not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, to gloom, to storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word would be spoken to them because they couldn't bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. If we look at these verses, and we remember that the the instruction from, from the first verse is to run with endurance, to run the race, and the race is a metaphor for Christian living. You run that race with endurance, fixing your eyes on Jesus. In these verses, we get to the how of that. Because in adversity, we can look at the adversity that's going on around us and we can say, why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to them? And we can come up with all the reasons why. Now, first thing I want to because I want you to be where I'm at on this, all right? I don't want you to follow me. Stick with me. Adversity is not the same thing as consequences. Those are not the same thing, but we often assume that it is. Why are bad things happening to me? Well, sometimes bad things are happening to you because you're doing bad things. Those are consequences. That's not adversity. If you get if you get picked up and arrested because you're driving under the influence, whether it's alcohol or weed, and you know, well, weed's natural. Oh yeah, it's natural, all right. So is snake venom. But if you get picked up and you and you get arrested there, that well, why is everybody always picking on me? Because you're doing dangerous stuff. That's consequences. That's not adversity. Okay. So now, scripture has a way of handling that too where we can make better decisions and we can learn from it. And, and that, might, that might be the kind of situation where you do ask, you know, why is it that every time I do something like this, bad things tend to happen? Okay, that may be the indication that you need to learn a lesson. Why is it that every time that I speak roughly to people and I'm mean and I'm, and I'm angry, people sit, tend to avoid me? Why are they being that way? Well, you might need to learn a lesson. That's called a consequence. All other adversity, which might be coming to us for no reason whatsoever that's obvious, we can ask why all day long. We can say, is this coming from God? Is this coming from Satan? Is this coming from people who don't like me? You can ask why, and it probably will do you no good. What we need to be asking in those situations is how. Do we deal with this? 
when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we know how. The first thing that he says, you can write this as note number one. Note number one. Point number one. Get a grip. I love that phrase. And it's there in Scripture, actually. Get a grip. Some of the translations say, you know, not just strengthen your weak hands, but get a new grip. All right? That, that's like, uh, that's, imagine, this is athletic metaphors here. Imagine the batter who has done a swing and a miss, okay, in baseball. And he might, you know, put a little rosin on his hands, get a new grip on the club. In other words, you've got you to reset. You've got to reset and get ready. Here with the runner, why does he mention hands and knees? Well, when you see a runner wear out, what do they do? They go to this position. I don't know what it is about this position, but it, it, maybe that's because you're thinking, okay, I'm about to fall down, so I'll, just, I'll get in the crash position so that when I fall down, I won't have as far to go. He says it's time to straighten up. It's time to straighten up. Let's get, the, let's get a new grip with the hands. Let's strengthen the weak knees. Let's get back in the race. Get a grip. Tired hands, weak knees, and we take a breather in this race, and we keep on going. That's his word of encouragement. By the way, that verse right there in verse 12, that is your first instruction word where he says you need to strengthen this. Um, in NIV, it says, strengthen your feeble arms, strengthen your weak knees. That's your first instruction word or command word. Now, the next one is, um, make a straight path. Wait a second, I thought we couldn't control the path. No, we, we can't. But we can help the circumstances for one another. Because one of the things you have to remember about all these command words is that they are plural. That means that this is not just you strengthen your weak hands and feeble knees. Y'all strengthen your weak hands and feeble knees. You guys strengthen your feeble knees, your weak hands. You guys make a straight path. You ones make a straight path, okay? Whatever your English second person plural is, that's what is being said here. We are helping make the path straight for one another. So when we're getting a grip and we're managing ourselves, we're helping one another. The best thing you can do for others is not fix them, but manage yourself. The best thing we can do for one another is manage ourselves. And then we have encouragement along the way. So here he says, make a straight path, because this is a team effort. We need to get everybody across the finish line. We will be stronger for it if we don't leave anyone behind, and if we keep going. So that's your first point. Get a grip. This is a team effort. Let's make straight paths for our feet, for the feet of others. Now, you know, how does that actually apply then? Well, it might apply by creating a certain environment so that when someone is going through adversity, the first thing they know is they're not going to be alone. They're not going to be left out on their own. That they're going to have people who are there. You know, and, and, and this is where Satan tempts us. Because we sometimes refuse to show even the simplest form of care because we let our own sense of self get in the way. Well, I wouldn't know what to say to someone. I, I don't know what you're supposed to say to them. You know, they've just been through a horrible tragedy. I don't know what to say. Like you're going to say anything that's going to make them better anyway? That's not the point. You don't have to say a thing. Show up and say, I care about you. Show up and say, I'm here for you. All right? That's all we have to do. That's all we have to do. In fact, we might want to just take a break and say, I'm not going to, I don't know what to say. Go ahead and admit that. I don't know what to say, so I'm probably not going to say much of anything other than, I care about you, let's pray together, let's look to God. Or maybe it's somebody who, um, you know, we need, we need to help them out a little bit. Well, I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to be in that awkward situation. I don't want to be... And again, we think about ourselves. 
But let's look to one another and let's look out for one another. Which leads to the second point here. The second instruction word or command word you will find in verse 13 where he says, no, 14, I'm sorry. Verse 14, make every effort. I don't like that translation. (laughs) And if we had slides, you'd see the better one. The better word there is, he says, pursue. Chase after. Remember, we're what? Running, you can say it, a race. We're running a race. What are we running a race for? What are we pursuing? What are we after? Two things. We are in pursuit of, that's your second point, in pursuit of, number one, peace. Remember that harvest of peace that comes through righteous living? We are in pursuit of that kind of harmony, that kind of peace. We make such efforts to sing together in harmony, don't we? Sometimes we make such efforts to sing together in harmony that those of us who aren't very harmonious say, well, we're going to take a step back. You know? Hey, harmony is not just about the sound. It's about the heart. Now, We'll help you and pray for you if you're way off key. All right, we can do that. But we don't want to discourage anyone. So sing to God. Anyway, my point is, we make such effort when it comes to singing. What about the effort we make towards peace? Sometimes we think peace is just not making any waves. (laughs) That... And, and that's what my professor Charles Seibert used to call that rabid peace mongers. That people who are like, no, 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 don't, no, don't cause any trouble, don't cause any trouble. Those were the kind of people that you referred to as rabid peace mongers, that no one's going to do anything. Peace takes work. Real peace. Because in real peace, you work through conflict. In real peace, you try to meet people. See their point of view. Understand where they're coming from. You try to look to others and say, okay, you know, I might be wrong. You might be wrong. We might both be wrong. But let's all all work on this. And we don't come at this in such a way that we, we leave things always in a point where we're just always in opposition to people. What good does that do? We work towards peace. We're pursuing it. He says here we pursue it with everyone. And this is important in adversity. Because adversity is the kind of environment that can breed either maturity or it can breed conflict. You see, adversity is just the the situation we find ourselves in. Whenever we think, okay, well, adversity then means that everybody's going to be unhappy. Adversity means that everybody's just going to be all stirred up. Adversity means that somebody's doing something wrong. Why, why, why? This is Satan trying to mess up our happy day. No. Adversity just is. How we respond to it determines whether it's going to produce a harvest of peaceful fruit or whether it's going to produce holiness. Uh, oh, actually, I gave you the two that actually work together. See? Thank you. Uh, whether it's going to produce peace, I need my notes. Whether it's going to produce peace and holiness, or whether it's going to produce this next thing that he mentions, the growth of a bitter root. You see, now you'll remember that. Without holiness, you, you cannot see Jesus. Now, Does that mean that without holiness, I'm not making it into heaven? I think it means more than that. Because you and I don't get to heaven on our own merit. We get to heaven by trusting in Jesus. We get to heaven by surrendering and submitting to Him and obeying Him. Now, that obedience and that entry into heaven is not conditional on our effort. It is the free gift of God. It is God's grace. How we put that into practice shows just how much we are really receiving, appreciating, and enjoying that gift that He gave us. Let me say this. When when the second point is we're in pursuit of peace, 
And we're in pursuit of holiness. Those are your two things I'd want you to write down. We're in pursuit of peace, and we are in pursuit of holiness. He says here, without holiness, we do not see Jesus. How did this whole chapter start? Fix your eyes on Jesus. How are you going to see Jesus to fix your eyes on Him? Not just in the afterlife, but how are you going to see Jesus today? How are you going to see Jesus in your life right now? You know, Jesus taught us that if, if we run around looking at the plank in everybody else's eye and we don't notice the speck in our own eye, or I got that one, see? Thanks, y'all are, y'all are catching this. Boy, not having these notes is really throwing me off. If we're going around looking at the speck in everybody else's eyes and we don't notice the plank in our own eye, okay, then, then, then we have a form of spiritual blindness that does not help us at all. And that's not holiness. That's a kind of a hypocrisy that the Sermon on the Mount is instructing us to avoid. We've got to see Jesus. We've got to see Jesus in this life that we live to know who to follow and what to do and how to behave. But if we're not interested in holiness whatsoever, we're not going to get there. Holiness is not just about being perfect. It's about having an interest in the things above. Take a look at Colossians 3.2 where we have to fix our eyes on things above, not on earthly things. When we do that, we start to see Jesus. We start to see Jesus now. We see where He's at work. We see what He would do. We study and imitate Him. I like astronomy. And I like seeing things and showing things to other people. So that then you see, otherwise, astronomy, you can just walk out and you can look at the night sky and you can say, oh, look at all those bright lights. But then astronomy goes to another level when all of a sudden you say, you see that bright light? That's Jupiter. Do You see that one over there? That's actually two stars. You can't see it right now, but if you had a telescope, you could. Do you see that right there? That's not a star, that's a galaxy. All of a sudden, this takes on new layers. And when you start to study it, then you see how it all fits together. So that then you can say, hey, wait, is that a star or a planet? Well, I know that stars twinkle and planets don't, all right? So this must be Jupiter, this must be Saturn. I can follow this one over here. That's not Mars, that's Antares, because that's why it's called Antares, because it looks a lot like Mars, but it's actually a star. You start to see it all when you study it, and you get to know a little bit more about it, and then it all fits together. That's the way we need to look at adversity, our own lives, and the, li- the world around us, so that all of a sudden we start to see Jesus at work in this world. And that's going to produce holiness in us. But we won't get there if all we're consumed about is what happens to me today for myself. And that's why he says you need to look out for each other. Okay, here's your third point. Look after each other. That's your, that's your next instruction word. Um, verse 14 was the former one. You make every effort to live in peace. You make every effort to be holy. You pursue it. And, and then he says, see to it. Verse 15 in the NIV, see to it. Or some translations say, watch out for one another. The word here that he's using is the word that we use for elder. It's based on that word episkopos or bishop, which is not a good translation. Bishop is a chess piece. Has nothing to do with church. Bishop, episcopos. But it's that idea of looking out, helping for one another. Now, this is not exclusive to shepherds here. This involves all of us. And there's three things he wants us to look out for. You can write these down. Number one, don't skimp on God's grace. Look out for each other and don't skimp on God's grace. I would say that this is the hydration that we need on the race is grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul says that grace is always enough. Remember, he's suffering from whatever it is that he's calling a thorn in his side. That's adversity. God says, he says, God, take care of this. God says, no, but I'll give you more grace. Grace is always going to be enough. Grace is always going to be sufficient. We don't need to skimp on the grace. We need to make sure that we're giving grace to one another. 
We need to be sure that we're giving grace to ourselves, but more importantly, we need to be sure that we're living in God's grace ourselves and one another. Third thing he says, when you're looking after each other, don't let the root of bitterness grow. And there's the language there. A bitter root is a poisonous root. It's toxic. Now this is where adversity can yield a peaceful harvest of righteous living, but adversity can also contribute to the poisonous weeds that are toxic. Adversity can lead to things like apathy. We can say, well, why not just give up? It can lead to things like despair. We assume that the present moment defines everything and nothing's ever going to get better. We assume that what we're experiencing right now is all that really matters. Adversity can lead to criticism. We start criticizing others, blaming all of our problems on others. Sometimes it might be consequences that we need to own or we might be looking to others. That's the poisonous root that is toxic. And you know, that poisonous root will grow. And it will stain and corrupt all of us, even if we're reacting to it. If you have one rude talker, you have one person who's causing problems, even those of us who recognize that, we might say, well, I'm just getting really tired of this. I think I'm just going to go and I'm going to shut them down. I'm just going to tell them what for. Okay, guess what? You've just been poisoned. But I don't believe the same thing they do. Yeah, but you caught the virus. You caught the disease. Put on your PPE, mask up, get the immunization of the gospel, all right? If it's not hurting anyone else other than them, then let them live with the poison. But don't you take a bite of it. That's where he comes in with his last look after each other, and he says, don't be like Esau. Poor Esau. If you haven't met him, this is Jacob's brother. Esau doesn't make it into chapter 11 where we talk about all the heroes of the faith. Esau is remembered for one thing. He's the firstborn son. We should be remembering the patriarchs as Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. And when you get to Esau, you've got the kind of guy that we really like. He's big. He's strong. He's a game hunter. He's got red hair. I mean, he's outstanding. He, hey, he has a lot of, you know, he, he does well with, with, with the women. I mean, he, he's, got, he, he's going to be a father of nations here, if you know what I mean. Esau, we, we really like him. But he's stupid. And he gives it all up for a can of soup. His brother, twin brother, says, okay, tell you what, you give me your inheritance and I'll give you a bowl of stew. Fine! Sounds good. Sounds like a good trade. I'm not doing anything with my inheritance and my birthright anyway. And here's Esau as a lesson to us. Don't give up your holy calling for a moment's need. Or what you think is a need. Don't give up your holy calling for a quick fix. That's probably not going to be a bowl of soup for most of us, okay? I don't see that happening. But oh, don't we have a list of things that we justify the instant gratification yeah, I don't know about this church thing anyway. It's not really working for me. I don't know about this following Jesus thing. It's all right. I mean, hey, I'll feel better during the holidays. I'll just, I'll just overeat. I'll overdrink. I'll oversmoke. I'll overuse. I'll do this. I'll just get mad at everybody. This is just the way it is right now. I, I am justified in indulging my needs. Because I've been doing this church thing for a long time. The wisdom here in God's Word, friends, is don't give up on your holy calling just for that one moment. It's not worth it. And in fact, even though it will be harder for you to hang on and do the right thing, 
you will not only win the race, but you'll make a straight path for others. You know, we, it, it amazes me that in this day and age, peer pressure is still a thing. I thought we got rid of that, you know. No more bullying, so peer pressure's gone, right? Didn't we, didn't we root that out of the schools? But No, peer pressure's still there. And then what we try to do, too, is we justify peer pressure. And even as adults, we justify it. And so no one wants to be a square. Nobody wants to be left out. And so we're just like, hey, you know, hey, we're all cool here. We're all cool here. I mean, you know, we're holy when we need to be holy. We're holy when we get together at church. We know how to act. We know how to behave. But really, you know, we can kind of relax a little bit. Say things that we're not supposed to. Feel things, that, you know, feel a certain way that we're not supposed to. Do things that we wouldn't want anybody to know about. But as long as nobody finds out, what does it matter? And adults, it's not just kids that do that. It's all of us in some way or another. We know better, but we don't do better. He's saying, you need one another. Now, the way to look out for one another so that you're not like Esau is not to go up and get in everybody's business, condemn them, shame them, and tag them when they mess up. You know, God gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, teachers. He didn't, give, he didn't give the church umpires. <laughs> we don't need any of you running around in a zebra-colored shirt, blowing a whistle, throwing yellow flags at everybody that messes up. That's that criticism and the bitter root, all right? No. What we need is we need everybody looking out for each other, saying, hey, you're on my team. I need you, I need you to be your best. You're on my team. You need me to be at my best. And so we're looking out for one another. And all of this is to get to the goal, which is the last thing he mentions here. Are we going to Sinai or are we going to Zion? Sinai is the mountain where they went up to approach God, and guess what? They found out God was kind of scary. And so they said, tell you what, God, you go ahead and do your God stuff up there on the mountain. We're going to kind of camp out over here, create some rules, manage a religion. And there's still people who are camping around Sinai today. It's just so much easier to talk about what the church ought to do and what the church should do and what the church should be and what this. And we never have to bring Christ into it. And it doesn't work very well. That mountain's going to crumble. That mountain's going to crumble because he says the day is coming when God's going to shake all of this. And he's going to shake things loose. All the garbage and the trash is going to get blown away. But that which remains is that which was always intended. That's Mount Zion. That's what's unshakable. That's the holy city of Jerusalem. Instead of condemning, being fearful, being discouraging, we can be... Notice how he describes Zion. It's joyful. There's a joyful congregation gathered around there. It's hopeful. There are people there who can approach God. God is willing to have us approach Him. And it is unshakable. Zion is the mountain that's going to endure adversity. So when we're called together around this table, you know, it, I hate the fact that the table of the Lord sometimes becomes the moment where we get into a self-condemning posture. Where we start to do this. Oh, oh I messed up. Okay, straighten up. Get a grip. Understand that you have been invited to the table of the Lord of Lords, of the originator and the record setter of your faith. He is inviting you to His table. Straighten up. Come correct. Get strong. Just say, hey, I am grateful. I am grateful to be here. And this may be the moment when my life changes. Because I'm going to run with endurance. And I'm going to watch out for my, for my friends and family that are on the same team. This is what we've been invited to, the mountain called Zion. Would you pray with me? Father, prepare us today as we gather around this table. Prepare us now in song. Be with Zach as he leads us in words of encouragement as we consider what it means to be invited to this feast. And Father, what it means to get into the race.
to endure in that race. We thank you for this, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Just as I am without one day. things hadn't gotten off to a kind of a, a rough start this morning, I would have introduced to you uh, the one who is going to come and lead us for communion. Zach Wolf is here with his wife, Natalie, and their, um, their new child who was born this year, Olivia Joy. And they came through our Lions for Christ campus ministry, and now they are working with the Encompass ministry at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And we are thankful to God that we raised our mission support for this year. They are included in that. This is the gospel of God working through the campus ministry that we've had here to extend out to other places, and we are very grateful for that. Zach, thank you for being willing to lead us in this. I'd ask you to come up now and lead us in the Lord's Supper table. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you guys uh, for just... I don't know, being who you are, it's awesome uh, to see how God has used Natalie and I, now Olivia, to start here at Lions for Christ, really wasn't uh, pursuing Jesus at all, and now uh, just to be where we are is just, it's awesome. So th thank you uh, to the Lions for Christ and West Ark for that support. But for uh, communion today, we're going we're gonna to be in Ephesians 2, and uh, as we read this passage in Ephesians 
I want you to listen uh, to the words uh, that, that Paul uses, knowing that at one point this was you, and now if you are in Christ, uh, you are free from that. But I think it's really uh, important and impactful for us to hear uh, just what we've been saved from uh, with Jesus. So let's read uh, the beginning part of Ephesians uh, 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So that is what we were, or if you are not in Christ, that is what Paul says you are. But the reason that we take this bread and this cup is because of Jesus, right? In remembrance of Jesus, because of what he did for us and how he saved us from those awful words uh, that Paul talked about in the beginning of Ephesians 2. But what's so awesome about that passage, it, it doesn't end there. It keeps going. And two of the most impactful words in all of Scripture is whenever you hear, see the words, but God. And so that's what we're going to be, uh, we're going to read the rest of Ephesians 2. So stay with me here. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross." thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Paul uses words like peace, citizens, reconcile. That, it, that is what this bread and this juice represent. So I want us to remember this. Just I don't know, that passage is just powerful, hearing all that Jesus has accomplished on the cross for us. As we pray uh, for this bread, uh, let's just remember, remember Jesus, plain and simply. If you'll please pray with me. Father God, uh, we come before you. Just so uh, so thankful for just your character, and so thankful uh, for your son Jesus. Uh, what a what a awesome time we have every week, Lord, to come to come together and remember the sacrifice that uh, Jesus chose to make uh, on our behalf. We we just praise you, Lord, for uh, including us in your incredible, wonderful plan. We pray as we take this bread that you would uh, just remind us and show us that uh, Jesus did not die on the cross so that we can sit on our hands and do nothing, Lord, but he did it so that we would live faithful lives to you with great joy because of the peace that you have granted us on the cross. So, Father, we pray all these things in your Son's powerful name, Jesus. Amen.
All right, let's, let's pray for the cup. God, uh, we, we thank you again just for who you are. And uh, I pray, Lord, uh, for, this, for this cup that represents uh, the blood that your son Jesus bore on the cross. Uh, it's just what a powerful reminder, Lord, it is for your love. What a powerful reminder it is for us as people who often struggle uh, with love to see the God that which we serve the love that you have. So Father, we, uh, we just pray that you would uh, allow this blood, and this, this juice to, to lead us deeper into a relationship with you and allow this remembrance, this time of remembrance, Lord, uh, to impact us more than just the next couple minutes of our lives, but to push us in all we do. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. As Chris said, uh, my wife and I and now Olivia Joy are in Athens, Ohio, and in huge part uh, because of people like you, churches like you, uh, that care about the gospel. They care about Jesus and his impact across the world, and so that's, uh, that's how we're in Athens, Ohio right now, uh, starting a brand new campus ministry from scratch on Ohio University. and. Uh, I don't know, I just want to take this time to thank you guys uh, for the love and care and support that you've shown uh, our family, uh, not only us, but the Sigmund family, who are also a part of the Alliance for Christ. They're there with us starting this campus ministry. And I don't know, we're just, we're just grateful that uh, God doesn't just work in one place, but he works in all kinds of different places. So thank you for uh, being a part of the work we are a part of uh, in Athens, Ohio. It's uh, awesome. And I'm going to just pray uh, for a time of offering if you guys uh, want to give as well. But I just really want to take this time to thank you guys uh, for, for being faithful uh, to the call God's had on your life. So let's pray. God, uh, we come before you just in awe of how big you are, of how in control you are, and of just how powerful your gospel is. Thank you for taking the gospel seed and uh, planting it in my heart, Lord, uh, through the ministry of the Lions for Christ and taking it and uh, allowing it to grow to the point where now you're, you're making disciples uh, in Athens, Ohio, and everywhere else, Lord, that you are doing your powerful work. It's awesome to see uh, just what you can do and how powerful uh, the name of Jesus truly is. So, Lord, we, uh, we give you all the glory. And we just pray that you will continue uh, to use the money, Lord, that you, you own and possess uh, to spread your name and to, to bring your name praise. We love you, Father, and it's in your Son's name, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we sing our last song, just a couple of reminders. Next Sunday, we'll have a 1030 assembly in here. So we won't have our Bible classes, but in 1030, we will have an assembly in here. Also want to invite you after church this morning, uh, immediately following in our Family Life Center, we're going to be honoring our Odell family um, and wishing them great, uh, good luck and, and pray for them on their next chapter of their lives. And their children are here too as well, so we'll enjoy company with them as well. So, so please join us after church for that moment of uh, fellowship. Uh, with the Odell family. We know that they travel during Christmas break, so this might be uh, some of our last times to, uh, to wish them well and to visit with them. So please stick around and uh, enjoy that fellowship uh, immediately after church. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing our last song. Listen to our hearts. How do you explain? How do you describe? Spirit. 
tell me what an awesome God you are. The words are not enough to tell you about love, so listen to our God. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine, and if I had a thousand years, Lord, I would still run out of time. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be here to worship you. Thank you for your great love for us. And Father, thank you for being here with us this morning. And Father, I pray as we leave this building that we will not forget who we follow and help us to show your love to the people we come into contact with. Father, again, thank you for your son and his great sacrifice for us. And Father, I also want to thank you for the blessing of the Odell family and the impact they've made here and all the lives that they have touched in their time here and as they prepare to go on to another place where they're still going to serve you, Father, I pray that you would bless them and watch over them. And again, thank you, Father, for loving us the way that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.